Sean Roxy T Hotter 1.9 FM, the voice of the people. This Wednesday uh, on the Citizens Forum, we'll be looking at uh, the continued efforts uh, to fight corruption. Well, beyond the issue of corruption, one major ingredient uh, to ensure uh, that uh, we have a corrupt, uh, free uh, society or nation is accountability and transparency. In the bid to have this uh, transparency and accountability in governments at all levels, uh, many have talked about uh, leaders, especially governors and members of the National Assembly, displaying or releasing details of how much they take home in a monthly or annually. No doubt Nigerians have been unanimous in their demand for the release and break down in details of how much a lawmaker actually earns. Not that I talk of either the Senate President or the Speaker of the House of Representatives. Others are also very much interested in the security vote of the governors, which many believe is always subject to the whims and caprices of the particular governor or whatever he wishes uh, to do with that security vote if thus with it. And people believe that this is also one way uh, to actually uh, perpetrate or, per, or, or to commit uh, corrupt uh, actions when you are in office as a governor. Well, so in the season of um, calling for transparency and accountability, you know, one of uh, the governors decided to uh, release or publicly uh, display his pay slip for Nigerians to see. Uh, governor Marcel Erofi of Kaduna State, after a, a bit of a back and forth or a public uh, uh, spat with the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Yakubo Dogara, released uh, details of his, uh, of, of his uh, pay slip, his uh, salary. Of course, uh, security expenditure. He was called out uh, saying that, uh, well, he did not tell us uh, how much you get a security vote. And that uh, the governor says he does not have a security vote because there is no such appropriation uh, by the budget of his state. What he has is a security budget uh, for uh, the entire state. We'll be looking at uh, this vis a vis. How much uh, information was released? The issue of uh, basic salary. What about the net pay? Allowances, tax deduction, and see whether uh, this slips released by these two uh, leaders were actually genuine. Are they the facts? Do they really represent the facts uh, of how much they really earn? If you look at that of uh, uh, Governor Erofi, for example, the pay slip released by the governor indicates that his basic salary is just 185,308 naira 75 kobo, while that of the speaker is 206,425 naira 83 kobo. The net pay of uh, both uh, stands at uh, 206,000. Uh, the speaker's net pay actually 206,577,087 while that of the governor is uh, 470,000 521. The allowances, uh, if you look at that of the speaker, we did not reveal much. He did not actually reveal how much he gets as allowance, uh, which, of course, is a detail most Nigerians are very interested in knowing. The only information he gave about allowance was the constituency allowance, uh, which is 175,000 naira 461. 175,461 naira and 96 kobo. Uh, as for the governor, he received 370,617 naira 50 kobo as hardship allowance. Well, you may begin to wonder what the sitting governor needs a hardship allowance for. Uh, tax deductions, uh, the Gara's pay slip shows that a monthly deduction of 55,952 naira is made for the payee, that is the pay as you earn tax. For that of uh, Governor of Fire, you have 85,404 naira, 51 kaba, deducted for the same payee tax. If you look at all this and uh, you add it up together, 
it seems it's nothing but a paltry sum that this uh, governor and uh, actually the speaker of the house actually takes home. what is this all there is to their take home pay monthly and annually this is what we'll be looking at this morning i am real so indeed i must say that you've actually dropped quite a number of points there but then if there's anything like you said um, nigerians are more interested in is the allowance or the allowances we received mm -hmm. by uh, elected uh well i'll call them representatives okay because even as a sitting governor you're actually representing your people mm -hmm. or representing the people but we don't always get to have anything on the allowances other than um their monthly salaries and all that but having said all that putting all this together <laughs> can we truly say that these represent what they earn monthly okay? well yes i i i think uh, with this that uh, they released uh, it's a bit uh, very controversial if you look at it and that is why we'll be digging deep uh, this morning to see how honest they've been uh, this is not to compare the two uh, public figures now to see whether who is being honest or not but uh, how honest all these uh, elected officials as like you said elected representatives have been uh, for example nigerians are very much interested in knowing how the national assembly spends about 115 billion naira annually what do they do with it <laughs> how do they how do they gob so much money especially in this period of recession uh, what do they use it for? Is it in the running of uh, the National Assembly complex? Is it in the running of uh, or payments of salaries of the staff of the National Assembly? Is it payment of uh, salaries and allowances to their legislative and their personal and media aids or whatever? Or is it uh, what exactly it is? Uh, or is it in the uh, buying of fuel, maintenance of generators? Because you might not, uh, don't be surprised if uh, the National Assembly is also run on generators uh, because of uh, the epileptic, uh, epileptic uh, supply of electricity uh, across the country. So these are questions that Nigerians are actually uh, yearning uh, to find answers to. We have someone in the studio that will be helping us uh, to look at all this uh, this morning uh, because uh, he has experience in this. I'm talking of no one else but uh, Chief Samson uh, Odebo, FCA, FNIM, uh, a senior citizen of the state. Uh, you're welcome once again to the Daybreak Show. Oh, thank you, everybody. So, uh, in the first instance, when you heard that uh, Governor Rufai uh, released his pay slip uh, and you saw what he released, were you convinced about the, the details on that pay slip? Well, I wouldn't say I'm convinced, and I wouldn't say I am not convinced. It is a submission that is subject to verification from so many angles. Let me start by saying that Nigerians have the right to know what actually is going on in terms of what we call transparency, accountability, probity, and stewardship. And I believe there are enough documentations, there are enough records that can give us the accurate and the authentic figures that has been reeled out. When we first of all look at the, the, the submissions, how authentic are the submissions? One, what are the sources of the submissions? We are talking of pay slip here. So I want us to look at it critically from the angle of what a pay slip is, from what salaries and allowances are supposed to be, and determination of what constitutes salaries and allowances of public office holders as well as national assembly members and various house of assemblies members let's start from the submissions if you look at the various uh, media releases or what do they call this uh, social media releases over the years and over the months the submissions as by the pay slips from the newspapers are far from the cry of the public about these various submissions that have been put on the various media. And it has, it has always been said that the, our assembly members or legislators earn the highest salary allowances in the world. That needs to be proved. 
But as I said earlier, what is a pay slip and what are salaries and allowances? Let me start by saying for the benefit of the people that salaries and allowances are periodic payments for regular employment on yearly basis and some of money allowed for specific purposes. And when we look at it critically from this angle, we can see that those things that are really related to their, to their offices exclusively, necessarily, and reasonably. So when you look at these qualifications that I've said, we want to move forward. Now, what is a pay slip? A pay slip is an integral part of the various documentations and records required to be kept and prepared and maintained in the personal movement section as regards payment of salaries and wages of an employee. It goes on to say that it states all the details, the various components, due to dues, remunerations that are due to an, uh, an employee from the employer. So it means that whatever is put on the pay slip must be the authentic figure that, uh, that contains the details of what is being paid to an employee in terms of its remunerations, in terms of salaries and allowances, as earlier stated. I want to say from the onset that when you look at a, a government accounting, there are enough documentations, there are enough records, there are enough control measures that actually from where you can really gather information, from where you can actually order the activities and transactions of government. So I want people to know that, that it is not because there are that of information, there are that of records, there are that of uh, procedures in, the, in accounting records, that these issues are now becoming the sort of recurring, the recurring decimal. It may interest the public to know that among other documentations, because the pay slip is just an integral part of the various documentations, we have what we call personal emolument form for each employee, of which everybody must have a pers personal record. We have what we call personal emolument record card. We have what we call group register. We have what we call salary variation advice. We have salary variation control sheet. The payroll summary, which is known as the voucher. That is the sum of the various columns in the separate payroll. Advice of deduction from salary, on payment vouchers, check or cash order from form, integrated personnel and payroll information system. And then in addition to that, we are in an era of computer. What, you, uh, what used to be prepared manually before now, can now be prepared through what we call the use of accounting packages, various payrolls. So it is now easy to compute. It is now easy to operate. And when, I, when, when you look at these various records that I've mentioned, they are processed on, on real time. So there can never be any dispute about it. Now, having said that, let's now look at the submission. We talk of basic allowances. We talk of constituency, we talk about recess. What are other allowances that are so necessarily, that are so uh, relevant to their offices? Those ones have not been given here. But from previous uh, submissions over the various media, we have heard about newspaper, we have heard about so many things. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly where I, I'm going. Because uh, if you look at uh, the Paisley, let's dwell a bit more on the Paisley of uh, the speaker now. Uh, all that was released by the media aid to the speaker, uh, Hazam, uh, is accurate with what the RMAFC, that is the Revenue Mobilization Allocation and Fiscal Commission, uh, stipulates that Mr. Speaker must get uh, the, the totality of uh, the basic salary of the speaker per annum stands at two million four hundred seventy-seven thousand one hundred nine naira and ninety-six kobo. Uh, that that that's that's the same the same amount the RMEFC set uh, for for that. Uh, if you look at the three months uh, period uh, pay slip that Mr. Speaker released, but he only provided details of three three allowances. 
uh, the allowances uh, for his constituency, and that's the constituency allowance. He also uh, released that of um, recess allowance, uh, recess allowance, and also uh, the basic salary. Now, if you look at other allowances that um, Mr. Speaker is entitled to, which he did not release, you have that of uh, accommodation allowance, there's a vehicle maintenance allowance, there's fuel allowance, there's entertainment allowance, there's utility allowances, there's responsibility allowance, there's annual leave allowance, there's wardrobe allowance, there's hardship allowance, there's newspapers allowance, and of course, uh, the list goes on. So, yes. if you look at this, Chief uh, it seems the basic salary is not the issue. It is the allowances. If you calculate all this together, at the end of the day, the, the figure might shoot up to over 20 million now. That is where the dispute is. And uh, let me talk about allowances. Allowances may be due to you and not given to you. How? If you are entitled to what you call house allowance or rent allowance, and accommodation is provided for you by your employer, that rent allowance will not be due to you it's because it has been given to you in kind. So it will not be, uh, be stated as part of your package here. But the expenditure in respect of that house will be under other under, under headings. So that, that expenditure will not be personal to you as an allowance. But if you are not giving uh, accommodation according to your terms of office, such thing may, may be uh, may be monetized and then added to your salary as part of your allowances. Then if there's a need for you to have access to what, what we have official vehicle, and the official vehicle is not given to you, but is monetized, then the issue of what we call vehicle maintenance or other things allowances will be there. But if the thing is provided by the employer, funded by the employer, you could be given a sort of impress whereby you fuel your car and some other things. Don't let, it, don't let, us, uh, don't let us even uh, go too far by that. The technical point I want to raise in respect of that is this. You said the revenue mobilization so, so, so has just released the basic salary. But if you look at section 70 of the Nigerian constitution as amended, 1999 as amended, section 70 says, a member of the Senate or of the House of Representatives shall receive such salary and other allowances as the revenue mobilization, allocation, and physical commission may determine, which means it behoves on the revenue mobilization and so and so to really let us know the various allowances that have been determined for this uh, for this uh, type of uh, of uh, public officers. Now, if you still go to uh, uh, section thirty two of part three, it is the responsibility of this revenue mobilization that we are talking about that part of their duty is to determine the revenue ap appropriate for political office holders including the president, vice presidents, governors, deputy governors, ministers, commissioners, special advisors, legislators, and the holders of the offices mentioned in sections 84 and 124 of this song's constitution. And so, 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 so. What do I want to bring out here? What I want to bring out is the idea that the Revenue Mobilization and Fiscal Committee, Commission cannot de uh, deny that they are not aware of other allowances that might have been determined for by, this by the lawmakers. By the lawmakers. No, if the lawmakers is not to, is not to determine. It is yeah, yeah, a to, 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 to determine. Mm -hmm. And then if you now look at subsequent uh, sections of the constitution, even the National Assembly has no power, has nothing to do with whatever the ROMF or what, uh, RMF. RMF has done in respect of their social. They are to determine, and even the National Assembly has no right to even prescribe what they have done. Now, now this, that takes us to, uh, to an issue, uh, uh, an issue of illegality and uh, deficiency of uh, morality, because 
If we look at the, uh, the, the section 70 of the Constitution, subsection A, uh, that you talked about, it stipulates that the RMAFC should be the one to determine. Anything outside what the RMAFC uh, determines is it's illegal, it's, it's wrong. But investigations have proven that about 15 million naira is given to each lawmaker as allowances, running costs. <laughs> running cost for their offices. Uh, they, 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 this is not captured in the RMC, uh, RMAFC's uh, uh, gazette, but it's always included in the budget of the National Assembly. And that is why it shoots up to about 115 billion era, uh, 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 annually. Isn't that illegal? No, no, don't, don't, let, uh, don't let us mix issues here as to illegality or, no, or not legality. You see, the issue of uh, allowances for the running of offices is quite different from allow salaries and allowances that are due to me. Because if I'm a general manager of a particular place, I will have to run my office by buying stationaries, by uh, incurring all the expenditure to run the office. No uh, doubt. No doubt. And we should not mix the uh, those things that they are supposed to purchase in running their offices as against what we now term salaries and allowances. Yes, Chief, let us the, go the, into the, the question. The quick question I want to quickly, I want to ask you is this: mm. Agreed that there will be running costs um, for for running of offices of these lawmakers. Now, is a national assembly. Uh, uh, what do you call it now? Uh, the office of uh, the, uh, the the clerk of the yes. national assembly, which uh, superintends over the running of yes. the national assembly complex, and of course under him will have all these uh, uh, details and all that. Now, should this so-called fifty million era be payable to the lawmaker, or it should be part of uh, the running cost of the national assembly complex? That, that that's the issue. Uh, the, the, the allegation is that it is being paid to each lawmaker instead of being used by the National Assembly Complex to run the offices of these lawmakers. Well, that aspect you have just highlighted, I wouldn't want to, uh, to say yes or no to that because it's a matter of, uh, it's a, it's a matter of, uh, uh, what do I put, a matter of management. Now, you see, people are mixing uh, expenditure in running my offices, in running an offices against salaries and allowances that are due to me, it will enable me to be comfortable to perform my role as an officer. You see, that is one angle that you have looked at it. But the, the, uh, the issue, uh, the way they run the offices, which I don't personally subscribe to, is what you have just said. You see, an amount, a, a, a bulk amount of 115 million, uh, billion that you have said mm -hmm. is normally known as what we call statutory transfer to the National Assembly, inclusive of payment of their salaries, inclusive of payment of allowances, inclusive of overhead and other things. That is a composite figure. Now, if you want to look into it critically, should a composite figure be released to them or should the various budget heads be appropriated just as various heads of expenditure of MDAs have been appropriated and accounted for? See, there are two ways now. If I am in charge of an office and then you now give me a box sum of money to run my offices aside my own salaries and allowances, the way I spend the other ones in running my offices uh, should not be regarded as non-accountable allowances. They should be accounted for. The uh, the amount of uh, the amount I use for buy, uh, for for buying stationery, the amount I used for buying other things should be there. You see, what people are now saying, which I subscribe to, is that a composite form uh, amount should not be released in block. To the National Assembly yeah, as, as, as it, without details. That's the point we are, we are trying to make. That their own expenditure too must be subjected to other procedures like uh, the various procedures of MDAs, expenditure of MDAs have been subjected to. And that
brings us to the fact that the issue of statute transfer, we should ask for the details or, uh, or composition of that bulk amount of money. And that is what the National Assembly are now defending, that the 115 million that you are, uh, billion that you are talking about is just 2% of the total national budget. It's just like a, a, an, an MDA, at an agency of government, also have their own allocation. But the allocation that's given to them is made up of salaries, allowances of the, uh, of the employees of that particular ministry, and their capital vote, as well as other running costs. You know, right. what, I, what I'm trying to say is that we should try to, uh, to differentiate between the two. Let us talk about salaries allowances, and then we now talk about other composite figure, so that people will be able to understand us clearly. All right, now let's talk about accountability here, because if monies are being dished out, given out to them, we're not even talking, talking I'm not talking about the salaries now, I'm not talking about the allowances, but um, going back to the question to be asked, how does that give room to accountability? That's exactly, we are saying the same thing, that the way they run it, the way they now uh, they, they do it does not give room for accountability, does not give give room for probity, because like a citizen, even the audit, the auditor too, we want to know if you want to audit that 115 uh, billion we are talking about, you want to go into the various expenditure heads, and these various expenditure heads we are talking about must have been appropriated according to the budget heads, and that is exactly what we are saying. When this composite figure is being presented, it should not be presented as a bulk sum. It should be presented as salaries, allowances mm -hmm. to lawmakers. Should be presented at amount of amount of stationery, amount of uh, whatever you want to use to run the offices must be presented as a as an as an expenditure aid, rather than saying it is a total statutory release. But the way they look at it is that this is statutory. Therefore, this amount will be released to me to run my offices and to pay my the salaries or so, so, so. Like you are saying, I will also want to know whether they don't have what we call service commission, like uh, in Ugu State, I think our own uh, House of Assembly, as we call House of Assembly, Assembly Service Commission. So if that type of uh, structure is in place, and a PS is in charge of that particular commission or whoever is there, that person should be responsible to account for all this expenditure that we are talking about. And even if it's not in place, the clerk of the house should be able to be responsible for this accountability, probity, and transparency that we are talking about. You see, what we are now trying to talk, talk about here is that it's a matter of showing details of the expenditure as appropriated and as spent, rather than having them lumped together. I quite agree with what you are saying. So if that is what, it, what they are doing, I think there must be a way of bringing the issue back for discussion, and then a way of actually doing the thing uh, in a right way, so as to give room for accountability and probity we are talking about. And that is why people are now uh, raising eyebrow about the way they now uh, keep the accounts of the National Assembly. Now, uh, one, one issue which uh, should interest Nigerians uh, for some people, uh, for example, uh, Lagos lawyer, uh, Festus uh, uh, Kiyamo, has said it would be laughable if Nigerians believe that uh, a governor, a sitting governor and a speaker ends just uh, 300,000 and there uh, a month. Uh, even the release of the space slip, which would have, you know, put paid to insinuations that yeah. this this uh, representative, so to speak, uh, earns so much bogus allowances and salaries, did not achieve that. So where do we go from here, Jivale? What we, what the lessons to be learned from this is that things must be put straight, and then the records must be properly accounted and recorded for that is that is a, that is part of the lessons from what we are discussing here now issues do, should not should not be mixed together i believe that their own uh, expenditure budget too must be presented accordingly 
and it must be appropriated, appropri uh, appropriated for and accounted for on, on what we call budget heads, just like any other MDA. That is where we are going now. That for us to be able to have confidence in the way they keep their records, records should be kept properly and in accordance with what we call international public sector accounting standards, which says that there must be what we call classification of expenditure and expenditure must be accounted for as per the various budget heads. It must be in line with what has been appropriated for. It should not be a sort of bulk figure that is being put in the budget. We want to see the summary may be 115 billion as you have said, but what is the composition of this 150 billion that we are talking about, which is inclusive of salaries and allowances, uh, which is inclusive of overhead, which is inclusive of running costs and some other things. What I'm trying to say is that this 115 billion we are talking about must be broken down into various segments for accountability purpose. The way it is being presented now uh, gives room for suspicion here and there. And speculation. And speculations. Okay, now uh, one. Yes, um, let's um, quickly look at that because, you know, when you were opening on this issue, you talked mm -hmm. about um, enough records, enough information, enough procedures and all that, but um, this information is actually available, okay? But now let's also look at the issue of public declaration. Even if this information, if we have this information available, what about public declaration um, of their allowances and not just about their, you know, their basic salaries? Is there anything wrong, you know, if they come out publicly and declare? That's why I'm saying there's nothing wrong in that. For transparency. But why, why is it that we don't always get to have that? I don't know because I don't know why people are hiding things. And when you hide things, it give it give it gives room for speculation. It gives room for confusion. It gives room for lack of confidence. Do you think that there is something that um, our lawmakers and our public, um, uh, you know, representatives are actually covering? I don't. I don't think so, because this one hundred fifteen billion we are talking about must have details somewhere. I believe maybe it is lack of painstaking. Maybe it is lack of not following proper procedure and so 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 and so many other things. Do we do anything right, um, you know, rightly in Nigeria? Because what we no, not generally speaking now, but when it comes to um, money and accounts, do keep we records. actually keep records? The records are there. The systems are there. You see, they may be distorted. The control measures are there. They may be overridden. These are the things. And that is why, for now, you are, you are getting a lot of information here and there. For example... Can we actually rely on this information when we're not so sure about the information and then when the information keeps coming in trickles and even those who are giving out the information, you're not even too sure of them? That is why it calls for urgent attention. Do you know that all these accounts and records we are talking about are supposed to be audited by the Auditor General for the Federation or the other auditors? Do you know that? But there are still a lacuna in the accounts of and the, in the auditing of the accounts of the uh, the National Assembly and other houses of assembly, in the sense that the Auditor General for the Federa uh, for the Federation of for each state, they are they have the responsibility for auditing the accounts of all public accounts, mm -hmm. and then even the corporations that we are talking about they have the responsibility of commenting on the annual audited accounts. And do you even know that there is a system or structure in place or rule in place that all these uh, financial statements, audited financial must be published in at least one or two or three uh, national dailies? Okay, and now, if they are not published? If they are not published, there are sanctions. What are the sanctions? The sanctions are that in the first instance, at the end of every year, number one, the accountant general for the Fed, uh, accountant general of the state or for the federal must give his financial statements to the auditor within 90 days, and then within that particular year days, the accounts must be audited. Even in addition to that, the auditor, the auditor general of any state or so so has the right to investigate any accounting or financial records of any of any public office. Okay. And then at the end of that period too, 
he has to make comments on the audited accounts. Apart from the fact that they have to be published, there is what we call public accounts committee at the National Assembly, to which he has to actually uh, report to. Even the public accounts committee must also hear the auditor general at, uh, at least once in a year to present all these audited accounts we are talking about. Okay. But the lacuna here is that who now audits the accounts of the National Assembly? That's it. That's it. That is where the issues are coming up, and when issues are coming up, they are coming up for us to address. Uh, especially see, when, when they refuse to yes, release details of yes. their budget. In that respect, I would suggest that the National Assembly uh, financial statement should be subjected to external auditing by external auditors. Okay. We have external auditors, and then the auditor general will have to comment on it and then present that account of the National Assembly to the Public Accounts Committee of the uh, of the of the of the House of which the uh, the, the, the the party that has the, the least uh, member is so is the chairman. So what I'm trying to say is that there are systems, there are there are enough rules, there are legal legal procedures, yeah, there is adequate framework, adequate framework so in place to ensure accountability. To ensure accountability. Mm -hmm. In well, government, it's, it's whether we, it's, the question is whether, the we, question is whether we are following it, following it, whether we are circumventing it, and whether even the public itself is so courageous enough to ask questions. Ask questions. Mm. If right. not for this, uh, what is it? Independent radio stations. Where well, we have what we call people's parliament. How much of these things do you normally hear in the past? All right, let, I want us to uh, to look at one issue. Uh, of course, that will be after the national news and then Abdurazak Namdas, uh, that's the spokesperson for the House of Representatives, while defending the speaker and the House of Representatives and uh, justizing uh, uh, Mr. Nasser El Fayed, the governor of Cardinal State, revealed that. The claims that 115 billion are budgeted for the National Assembly for 469 members, uh, 109 said it was 60 members of the House of Representatives, also takes care of salaries, allowances, expenditure, and running costs of these 469 members, and salaries and allowances of about 3,000 legislative aides, and salaries and allowances, equipment and maintenance of about 5,000 staff in the bureaucracy of the National Assembly. <laughs> you begin to wonder. Uh, you yes, know, it's right. Uh, that's it. That's now, it. If you, if you look at it, Chief Odebo, yeah. what does the National Assembly or 469 members need 3,000 legislative aides for and the premium salaries and allowances? How many staff, how many members of staff are needed to run the National Assembly that we need 5,000 to actually run it efficiently. These are questions I want you to answer, but that will be after the it's National okay. News. At the end. Right now, we'll take a break. After National News, we'll be back. Chief Samson Adebo will still be here in the studio. Stay with us. Thanks for a Monday day break show. It's beautiful. Wednesday morning, what we're looking at uh, is still uh, the pay slips uh, as released by the governor of Cardinal State, Malam Nasser Erufai, and the speaker of the House of Representatives, Honorable Yakubu Dugara. We have at the studio Honorable Samson A. Odebo, FCA, FNIM, a senior citizen of the state, so with us uh, as uh, analyst this morning. Uh, Honorable Odebo, and before we enter that break, I was talking about the justification for having 5,000 members of staff in the management of the National Assembly and 469 members of the National Assembly having about 3,000 legislative aides, where each one of them are also paid salaries and allowances. Yes, you are right, to a simple extent, but the number of uh, any aid that is that a legislator should have is not statutorily fixed and some other things. So if you want to look into that, if you want to see that as, as a problem and want to address it, the way to address is address it is to have what we call personnel audit, which will justify whether it is justifiable for that many number of aids to be in a particular place. And then whether the number of aids they are talking about are 
not in conformity with the existing law and regulations. So those are the things that we have to be put in place. For us to be talking about on air, we don't have any justification to say yes or no, except we, address, we see it as a problem and we want to address it and move forward through what we call personnel audit. Okay, uh, because of uh, our time into the personnel that we quickly release the serial lines and of course other channels for people to be part of the discussion this morning and the lines are buzzing already. The serial lines remain 9 868 and 909 so called legislators. And uh, for the first caller that said the uh, salary should be personal, how to disagree with this? The public office holder, the salary should be a public issue. That is why the new mobilization of the Salvation Committee should come up and tell us how much each member of the Dallas Assembly has taken. Exactly. And government should come out and, uh, and, be, and be very sincere whether you have to pressurize them or push the so called legislators we are having. To enact a bill to make that office less attractive. That might be difficult, but I think the docile followership we are having is the reason why they are still enjoying this boost. By the time we have a very informed followership and people know the value of money, they will know that these legislators are actually shortchanging them. My submission is this, Chief. Yes. How soon do you think informed followership? can influence the remuneration of the third years of government. Um, because of what you have said, you have explained it that a lot of people did not know. And I'm sure that the questions they are going to ask now is going to be very informed questions. We have been going along, oh, they earn 50 million, oh, they earn 50 million, look at what they are earning, and we don't even know what it means. You have explained it to us. That is the salary of Aerofine. That is the salary they want to publish is what they collected. But there are other allowances which has not been reflected there. Who's that is the salary? But that's not the, uh, what they take home. Salary is different from take home. Which is not a person know. That is what they end. The issue is not them. The issue is us. If we feel so, there are agonies to go for the dress. But we should stop. People should stop misinforming people, creating problems, and then only deal of the policy. All because they want to go score some points. You you don't so well, sir. I am so very satisfied with what you have said this morning. I hope other people now will now so want to talk. When I talk, what Facebook talk, WhatsApp talk, which has no basis at all. You just say what you like and you think you have done something. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, right, sir. Thank you. One more call. Yes. Uh, yeah. it's okay. Yes, it's okay. Oh, thank you, my brothers. Let me start for my Honorable Johnson Oluwafa Olufatoki. Well, your submissions have noted them, and uh, the first submission that uh, the box sum we are talking about is made up of recurrent, non-recurrent capital, and so so so. I think we have said that in the course of our uh, our discussion here. But the most important aspect of it that people are agitating for is the breakdown. The composition of the 115 billion that is normally put as statutory transfer, which is which is a box sum, which I believe also that the details are somewhere, and these details must be made available to the people, rather than saying the National Assembly is spending 115 billion or has budgeted 115 billion. We know that the amount of 115 billion may be infinitesimal as it has been defended that it's only 2% because they have a lot of uh, areas to cover. But the issue here, here is that for purpose of accountability, probity, and transparency, they must make the breakdown of this figure available for the, pub for the public to ensure confidence in them. Now, the submission of the people of this pay scheme that is far from the truth, I wouldn't want to say yes or no, like I said earlier, but I have presented the facts. Even in addition to what I, what I, Fatoke has presented, 
a civil servant who's on grade level 17, uh, step 9, which is the highest in the state, will not earn more than 333,222.35 per month, made up of basic of 124,914, rent of 74,000, transport, mail, utility, entertainment, and domestic. These details are there. Why can't we get the details for the for the National Assembly members just like this? If in the submission, in the figures that have been submitted to us, these allowances are broken down, and then the uh, the Revenue Multiplication Allocation and Fiscal Commission has also come up with the total um, emolument, with total allowances, the issues we are discussing here and then will have, will have been laid to rest. Salary allowances made known is personal. No, I don't believe a public officer should should not be able to uh, to 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 to, uh, to tell the public the actual amount is spent in it as they need to do so. And I believe uh, somebody has done justice to that. But it's a public officer, and that there's no, if there is a need for him to declare the total salary allowances that is is that is is earning. He has to do that. We cannot say that he has not disclosed that to tax authority because he has to disclose everything that is getting there. So to that, I say I don't agree that uh, it's personal to him, and therefore he should not be he should not be disclosed. He has a need for disclosure. He should he should be able to disclose it. Then the second officer is that how can we influence uh, the followers can influence the National Assembly. To take certain decisions this is part of what we are doing like i said earlier we want to uh, give it to the private radio stations that have actually created uh, a forum for public uh, parliamentary and what is what do, they, what do we call it to hear our views for people to be educated for people to be enlightened so that if you have informed followers uh, the informed followers can come together and then influence certain decisions of the house in the first instance, when public, uh, what do they call? What do they call it when they want to make public uh, presentation of a uh, bill in the house, public hearing? So we should be able to go there to really contribute. When there is a need for us to go to the, uh, to the various houses of assembly, we should be able to go there to influence it. When they come home, also, if you have access to these people, we should be able to influence them. Then another area that I want us to know, and then I want us to really consider, is the influence of money. When there is a need for election and want to vote, don't get anything from anybody. People have the view that it is our money. We will get it from them and we won't vote, vote for them. The Yoruba will say, Ti enubaje, ojuati. And even your conscience too will, too will not be clear. Don't take anything from anybody vote according to your conscience when they want to give you money refuse the money if you refuse the money they will know that they are rejected outright and that you are going to vote according to your conscience when we were growing up in the uh, uh, in our villages when you see somebody who is uh, who, who came up with wealth suddenly you run away from such people in those days where did we where, where did we how did we get it wrong now, Dr. Income, I agree with you that the other allowances must be disclosed, and it is the responsibility of the Revenue Mobilization and Location and Fiscal Commission to disclose other allowances because they have the responsibility for determining the salaries and allowances of these people, and the owners lie on them to come up with fast and figures so that the public will not be confused. Uh, my brother Ari Ariwoko. Has talked about right and responsibility. You see, you cannot take away people's rights. People have the right when they work for you, they have the right to pay them salaries and allowances as determined and as agreed to. As long as it is their right, continue to, to give it to them. But there's no hidden place for public, uh, for public transaction. You should be able to explain in detail to the people. You should be able to carry them along as how their money is being spent. 
detail by detail so that there won't be com confusion and there will be a sort of thing called transparency and understanding among the governed and the governed. In fact, one of the uh, one of the advantages of uh, government accounting is to demonstrate accountability and to assist people to appraise and appreciate the efforts of government. So the, the way they present their figures, the, the way they present their records must be transparent enough for us to have confidence in them and for us to be able to assess them and appreciate what they are doing. Thank you. All right, let's go back to the comments. Uh, many have uh, have gone wrong about, uh, many things have gone wrong about uh, uh, governments. Look at the money they are collecting and they pay 56,000 Naira. And to pay 56,000 Naira minimum wage is a problem for them. May God devour us in this country. That's coming from Bukumi. Oh, thank you, my brother. So, quite a lot of contributions and a load of thoughts and a apprehension here and there. So, I want to talk about the uh, issue of independence and accountability in government, uh, in government service or government accounting first, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as asked by Mr. Yuadi Shorunke. You see, that... Uh, that those two questions will have called for a seminar on those issues, and uh, which will have been actually demonstrated or uh, answered through so many case studies. You see, the first thing that is lacking in government is the issue of what we call a servant master relationship. From my experience in the mainstream of the service, because I have the opportunity to God be the glory of working in the private sector, in the parastata, in the mainstream of the service, as well as in the local governments. So I have all those experiences behind me. Now, in the mainstream of the service, the main thing there is serve, serve, uh, master servant relationship approach to issues. The issue of, um, I have no apology, but I, I want to say, I'm saying it the way I see it because I've experienced it. The issue of working as a team per se appears to be lacking in the mainstream of the service. Whatever your boss says is the ultimate. That is why in most cases, there are these circumventions here and there, here and there. And another thing is lack of courage and fear of losing one's job. These are the issues that actually contribute to a lot of problems in the mainstream of the service. In the first instance, the politicians we are talking about cannot uh, unilaterally do a particular thing without making use of the civil servants. Uh, let me use, let me borrow the word of my governor, the landlords. The landlords are there, they are, they are supposed to be to, uh, to be able to intermediate and keep the service running, whether the politicians are there or whether they are not there. So the onus lies on them to ensure that the system is really implemented with the letter. Because they have so many backings, constitutional backing, legal backing, procedural backing, and so many acts backing them. And one thing they don't even realize is that when the ships are down, they can even pass the buck on you. I've had, I've had an experience where a general manager of a particular place has, uh, has told his accountant that I am not an accountant, I was not properly advised. And this is why the civil servants must be very careful. You must have a policy, you, have a, you, must, have, you must have a discipline to drive your profession. First of all, see yourself as a professional. Number two, don't see yourself as a sort of uh, this, uh, what do they, eye service. Don't play eye service here and there. Let your dead people know you for your policy. And when you are asked to do certain things, ensure that, that there are enough memo, there are enough uh, procedure that you have followed. I am not saying that you should be rigid about things. For example, let me give you one of my own experiences when I was in service. They know me that if you ask me to do a particular thing, 
verbally, I will, I will not say no, I will not say yes to you as a boss. I go back to my table, I reduce whatever we have done or you have told me into memo form. I will tell you the procedures, the implications, the way to carry out your policy or directive. And if it is not in line with the lay down uh, policy, I will tell you how to go about it, but I will end my memo by saying, however, you may wish to give further directive. Without any act of insubordination, when I was in the mainstream of the service, the issue of master servant relationship was out of the way. The first day I got to the mainstream of the service as treasury coordinator was that I said, whenever I want to see the, my boss, who is the accountant general, nobody should delay me at the ante room. And some people had it, they went to tell her. And then she called me and they said, I said so, I said yes. Because where I came from, we work as a team. Whenever I want to see my general manager, I work freely to him and I consult with him. I do whatever I want, I want to discuss with him. There and then, he told his secretary that any time that I want to see her, he should give me the way to see her. In the mainstream of the service, if a, uh, a PS, if somebody is the director is with a PS, and you are there before the PS, maybe of a lower rank, maybe from other area, as soon as the director arrives, you are supposed to leave that particular place for, for, for the director. Until they finish their discussion, whether you, have, you are true with him or not, you have to leave the place. You see, what I'm trying to say is that there is a bit of uh, the issue of master server relationship should, should, should be removed so that people can work freely, people can easily work as a team. I'm not saying that what they are doing is wrong, but these are the things that need to be put in, in place. Now, you and if there is a need for you not to carry out uh, another, do it politely. And when there is a need for you to exit yourself out of the system, do it. It is better to lose your job than to lose your professional certificate. And of, and of course, we professionals, we are like a needle with a, uh, with a thread. Because if you are reported your professional body, your certificate is at stake. If you look at your certificate, they will say this certificate belongs to so, 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 and it can be withdrawn at any particular time. So, these are the things that you have to put in place. There are a lot of things that we can say about whether there is any hope in the civil service. I, 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 I believe there is enough hope in the civil service because we still have some disciplined people in the service itself. Now, about two days, far, far like this, uh, talking about constituency projects. You see, there are a lot of expenditure they, that they are being hidden under inexplicable, unexplainable budget edge. The idea of constituency budget, budget, uh, project is not to be a sort of allowance to the lawmakers. My understanding of it is that if I am, uh, if I am, uh, I am, I am a legislator in my own particular world, maybe there are certain things that my world will need that. We, uh, that they have not considered in the budget. During the budget preparation, I will lobby to the extent that I will be given at least one consult, one project in my particular area to be cited in any of the world. And that is the idea, in order to be able to have, to have a sort of what we have, even distribution of amenities. It will be put in that particular budget. The money will not be released to you. The money, you will, uh, they will have to have a contractor within the lay down policy who will do the job and your own is just to see that the work, the work is carried out so that your people can actually benefit from the uh, from the benefit uh, from the dividend of democracy that is the idea of constituency project the issue of constituency project allowance i cannot understand if there's anything like that and there is no strategic budget for what we call constituency project allowance it is still part of the budget that has to be presented to the national to be appropriated for. Then issue of feedback. See, there are so many fundamental problems that that is militating against that are militating against the issue of feedback. In the first instance, these people that you are looking at as your representative, 
do you think they see you as the people that actually elected them? That's the first question that, that we have to ask ourselves. Do they see you as their as, as as their, their constituent. as their uh, constituent members? They, do they see them as being accountable to you? Why am I asking these questions? I am asking these questions because of the way most of them get uh, get elected, and because of what they have to go through through before they get elected. They have to spend a lot of fortune. They have to make a lot of sacrifice to the extent that these elective offices that we are talking about have become a sort of investment. And then if you now see something as an investment, what you have to do there is that the first thing that you have to do, recoup your capital, get your gains, get another capital that will enable you to go back to that particular position so that you will put yourself in an advantage. So in most cases, these people do not even see us as they are or they have, uh, uh, they are the people to be uh, to be to be accounted to. So these are the issues that you have to look into, and that will take a lot of uh, uh, a, a lot of mindset before we can uh, change this mindset because you can do that. Now, Mr. Odeyinka, you talk about democracy. You see, the way I see democracy, because to me they have actually dented democracy. Democracy, government of the people by the people for the people. It is meaningless to me. My own demo, my own, my own definition of democracy is this: democracy is upholding the rules of law, empowerment of the people. When I say empowerment, you empower me by giving me good quality health. You empower me by giving me good quality education. You empower me by give, giving me good quality electricity and amenities, and then that will enable me to enhance my potentials. And then when you do that, that will be for growth and development. That is my own understanding of democracy. So when you say the democracy is a government of the people and the people of the people, it's meaningless. And it has no, uh, no deep-rooted deep thinking. But if you look at democracy from the angle that I've narrated, you will see that democracy itself is very good and it's for the people. I think there are others. Uh, you talk about uh, security vote. I don't think there's anything like security vote. There is something like security budget. How is it determined? It has to be determined according to, to the needs when budgets are being presented. The security budget is normally maybe in the office of the governor or in the office of uh, the chairman, in the office of uh, whoever is the chief security officer of a particular place. The only problem with security budget or security vote is that, by tradition, it cannot be audited and it cannot be investigated. Maybe because of the abuses that we are now seeing, maybe we have to introduce issue of accountability and transparency into the spending. And then the, uh, the criteria that must be put in place to determine the limit of uh, the security budget. So I don't believe there is security vote, but there is security, security budget, which is not normally accounted for. I think another one national health. Somebody said there should be a national assembly, assembly commission. I think I've said that earlier. So for accountability, for checks and balances, for record keeping, for uh, what is it? For stewardship, accounting, and some other things. I believe there must be a national assembly uh, assembly commission. I think that there, there is in Ubu State here. So if others can now replicate it, so that it is the head of that particular uh, commission that will be account uh, accountable for all this that we are talking about, accountable for accountability, probity, and some other things that we are talking about. Then the head of that commission will also be subjected to. Uh, to the National Assembly or to, uh, to the, the, the State, assembly, assembly. State of Assembly when the budget of the State of Assembly is being uh, appropriated. Alright, let's wrap it up with this message from Honorable Johnson Olu uh, uh, Members of the public are free to one, attend the plenary and observe deliberation on the floor of the House. Two, request for information directly from government agencies. And three, people should avail themselves with necessary documents such as the state and law books, Nigerian constitution, etc. All three are available for the public.
All right, thank you. Uh, I agree with you. But how many people can go that that low? How many mm -hmm. people are interested? How many people are committed? How many people have passion to know what is happening within this environment? The issue now is that well, how, how much can I grab? How much can I take? So these are the things. Even the politics we are playing in this country, I'm sorry to say, is a politics of rice and beans. You see. You see, another thing that we can introduce, if you want the political party to belong to the people itself, I think a sort of what we call levy or subscription should be introduced so that every party member will be a financial member of political parties, rather than allowing some people or the government to really finance the party's expenditure. All right, it is on that note that we will call it a day on the day show this beautiful Wednesday morning. Thank you so much for being part of the show. We sincerely want to appreciate you, Honorable Chief Samson Honorable. Thank you for honoring our invitation. All right, uh, have a wonderful day. I am Toby Joseph.